I get so many questions about what inspires you. It's changed the guitar itself, really, at this point, tremendously. Welcome to the Acoustic Guitar Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Grizzle. For this episode, my co-host Jamie Stillway and I sit down with boundary-pushing guitarist Khaki King. An article from the September 2003 issue of Acoustic Guitar Magazine reads, Khaki King's focused intensity summons up a kind of kinetic power and passion that can stop surprised, slack-jawed onlookers in their tracks. Plenty has changed in the 20 years since that was published, and since the release of Everybody Loves You, her solo debut album. But as you'll hear, King's passion and intensity are ever-present. Before we dive in, I'd like to take a moment to thank Elixir Strings for sponsoring this episode. Whether you play for pleasure or your livelihood depends on it, you demand the best gear. That's why players like Khaki King choose Elixir Strings. Experience great tone, comfort, and extraordinary durability day after day after day. Elixir Acoustic Strings make everything you play sound better for longer. Get a set today at elixirstrings.com. You can find that link, plus links to additional resources related to this episode, in the show notes. As always, thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoy this episode with Khaki King. Now I'll kick things over to Jamie to start the conversation. I'm curious, like over the years, again, this is maybe an impossible question to answer, but like what has changed or how have you changed your outlook on life to then influence your approach to music and composition? I don't have any idea what you're talking about, and I don't have any idea of what I'm doing 99% of the time. I just do the stuff. I mean, yeah. sorry, I wish I could like figure out the, the formula so we could all be creative all the time. I, I still am waiting for someone to tell me. I just show up and I hold the guitar and I get the crazy idea and I try the thing. I have to break the cycle of self-criticism as far as just simply like writing a song, writing a solo guitar song, for instance, that is, that has remained unchanged, which is that I have to just be playing guitar. I know that sounds really like a super oversimplification, but if I can get somewhere that's kind of cozy, hold the guitar. It's okay if there's some chaos around me. It's okay if there's stuff happening, people talking, whatever. But if I can just be playing, then the stuff just, it, it, it eventually squeezes itself out. I also want to know when you're like making up a tuning, how do you do it? What do you do? You just turn, turn them until they sound good to you? There's so many different ways of altered tunings. It's not like you're, it, it really comes down to what is, what makes sense. So you have, you know, so you have the loveliness of the open string, right? So that's really why we do these open tunings. There's no, we're having the open string ring out while other things are happening. So you kind of have to find what those mean in the context of this new tuning work. Let's say we're making a new tuning. Okay, so we're like, well, I really like this, this sound of these two strings together. And maybe they're a, maybe they're a major second apart, or maybe they're a fourth apart, or, or maybe they're a six, whatever. Um, so when they, they ring out together, it sounds really cool and I can do all this other stuff, but it literally makes it impossible for me to now play this riff that I like so much. So maybe, maybe I can get the same bang for my buck, huh? If we do a similar something over here, or maybe actually it's not the, maybe that note is actually captured better on the low D. I don't know. It's just, it's, it's without, without verbalizing all of that, that's kind of the process. Like, I can't make this, you know, I like the sound, but now there's nothing to do on the fretboard. It's just a beautiful open sound. So let's make it something that we can actually play. I get a lot of, well, how do you know what you're playing? How do you know what note you're playing? I'm like, I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> like, there's like three people in the world who can tell you what note they're playing in every single alter tuning that they have. And they are 
dealing with other issues as well. So like, go with God, man. I have no idea, but don't worry about it. Know the intervals, you know, know how the notes relate to each other. If, if you don't know that it's a B flat, but you know that that's, you know, a minor third, then that's all that's, we're good there. So when you're composing stuff, do you write, do you have a pedal board? Do you play with effects when you're coming up with ideas or do you mostly write acoustically? I still write acoustically. I think it is convenient, first of all, because I'm not writing a song in a, in a, in a week. I'm writing a song over a course of six months and it just slowly pushes its way out or gets refined or I play it at a sound check or I play it at a, you know, it, it, it just takes a very, I don't know. Most of the songs that I've written have not, I have no idea that I'm writing them until they're kind of almost there. Um, so no, and I also think it's kind of, it's kind of just that, that still there's that one last purity test of like, does it stand up on its own on one guitar? Is there enough there to, to chew on? And if so, then yeah, that's a, that's, that's a song. And then whatever else we do with it is going to just be good. You said it takes like, six months to write a song is that pretty standard for you i don't know stop asking me about standards i <laughs> well, have i'm just no curious if something ever just I, comes guys, and it's like i know you're all everyone's like what's the what's the scoop what's the juice what's the real deal i don't know <laughs> i would tell you i would this this you would just read about it in my memoir because i'd not be talking to you because i'd be fucking rich and living in paris okay like how do you write the perfect song <laughs> khaki <laughs> i mean it's like I I have no idea. I, I I will say I'm a refiner, and that is again something kind of. I think that's like I've that's hard fought for me, that I don't get it perfect to the enemy of the good, and I know when to just allow the allow the thing to be an idea, a riff, a little. A little this we're gonna you know I'm gonna work on it later and honestly a lot of times and I'm very blessed in this way and it's I don't know it's kind of changed over the last years because I've been doing so much kind of standardized like this is the set of music because this is inside of a bigger dramatic thing but a lot of it will get um, worked out live so I will able I'll be able to um, p- play a song before I ever record it and feel how it feels in front of an audience and or even like like I said soundcheck I think is one of the greatest times to to write because you get like you know this big giant sound you're so much larger than life but it's still empty there's no pressure but then there's a couple people milling about so you don't want to sound like an idiot so um I think that's a good that's a good time to write songs do you take long sound checks to kind of explore no. that no oh no well yeah i mean the sound check itself is over as soon as i can as soon as i can because i'm usually hungry <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah no i'm that's... like you know you roll you know you roll in and and you're like okay i have to i have to feed right she has to have a feed so let's 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 get this thing over with so we can have a feed so i'm usually just starving um but then if i get a snack and i can come back and like spend some time so yeah I'll, I'll get up there and and uh spend some time if i can just hearing just hearing stuff in a different co- uh, context we have asked other touring musicians before sort of questions about like how do you stay sort of grounded do you have a regular routine about practicing do you feel like you need to practice when you're on tour you just do it at the show at soundcheck doesn't matter uh i like to be i like to so I'll be doing some shows in early February, for instance. I am super, super rusty. I have spent the last six months or more um, in a very different physical space for myself. I had a surgery, and I wanted to get really strong, and then I wanted to do a handstand, so I'm learning how to do handstands. <laughs> so don't. I, I can already hear people being like, you're going to break your wrist. That's probably true. Um <laughs> But I, uh, so uh, so let's just say I'm rusty. We don't have to go into it. Why? But I will definitely make sure I don't go out, like, unable to do what the job requires. So I'll, I will practice and I will make sure that everything is sounding good and feeling good. And if there's something that I'm just not, you know, getting, then I'll, you know, I'll, I will do that. But will I do that? I, I have not yet discovered that that's a thing for me to do. 
it's a touring thing, you know. If I am if I have expected to be at my best, I will figure out how to you know maintain that. Obviously, the best way to be at your best on tour is to be at your best the night before and the night before that. And then, you know, it's hard to like jump in. But I will tell you that if I'm it doesn't matter the length of the tour, the the third to last show is always the best. Always. What why? What I've I've never heard know. this before. What? No. It's cuz you finally figure out what you what you were trying to say the whole time. Hmm. And 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 you and you and you're not so tired, mm-hmm. and your body's not just like, oh, okay, let's just go home. It's not the last show where you're like, okay, I'm gonna give it my all. No. No, because the last show is a different. It's different because you do give it your all, but that it could be it's a, it could be more messy. It could be more like, it's just kind of you know you've like exploded. But I think the third or maybe the like the last week of show, whatever it is, there's something that happens where you you it's. The, the fluidity and the precision like match up. So you these shows that you you mentioned you're you're rusty for is that going to be um, the older the older material? My plan is to play the record start to finish. Oh, cool. Um, we shall see though. It may maybe that's not maybe that's not even what you know. We'll see how that how that feels how that lands. Um. But I will certainly be pulling from, you know, the uh, 20 plus year catalog at this point. Um, but it is it is certainly time for me to kind of acknowledge the, the passage of time. It's actually, oddly, it's 21 years since I released it personally and sold it to people in Subway. <laughs> There's also, you know, some of those songs were written almost 25 years ago. So there's... It, it it's just a again we acknowledge the past the passage of time through but through ritual and performance and and gathering which is you know we're lucky to be able to do and um i think that if if people are really drawn to that idea and it feels really good then the future shows um later on this year will be in that format and if i am uh restless with new things that I want to do or you know, new ideas I want to try out that do have a visual element or just you know playing with effects with my computer, whatever it is, then I, I will do that. I, I'm lucky to have that flexibility and I'm very lucky to have an audience that expects the unexpected. <laughs> what, what do you think, I mean, if you could put yourself in that position in 2003, your young adult self there, um, if that person had heard the music that you're writing and releasing now, what do you, what do you think that 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 person would have thought of this. I, that person was a total hater, so she would have been like, "Oh, she sucks," and <laughs> <laughs> that person was a very depressed, you know, like could not find joy in too much because that you know, I that's just who I was. I was very, um, yeah, I was I was critical of everything because that was insecurity and incredibly critical of myself and and so if i had heard me now there would not have been a like oh yeah i want to i want to get to that point it would have been like oh she is so overrated um and that's just again it's all personality though i think if i had objectivity back then i would again have been on a different path so let's be glad i didn't you play you play drums every day and i i i read somewhere that that was like one of your, your first major instrument was was drums so i I started playing guitar when I was really, really young, but drums and percussion, I started playing in school band at fourth grade. So all of my musical education, I should say, the bulk, the, the vast bulk of it comes from um, being a percussionist in band. Um, and a lot of my, um, a lot of what I did socially was play music with people. And since I could play drums, that was, and I had the, the garage with the drum set in it, then that was how I... Everybody goes to your house to play when you have the drum set. I think that the most... The thing that I do with the drum, with having played drums for much of my life as well as guitar, is that it's all about the independence of the limbs. So, and I've demonstrated this a lot at times, but I will... uh, I can do, you know, I can do something pretty simple with just hammering on with the left hand and I can do something again it's fairly simple with the right hand and it makes when I put those things together on the down and upbeat etc it makes something sound a lot more complicated than it actually is 
And I think that is a pitter, you know, that's something like, I mean, it's really, what, the one hand's doing this, the other hand's doing, but this is kind of, So when you apply that to the guitar, you can get a lot of bang for your buck. I mean, literally banging on the guitar for your buck. Hey! It was a stretch. It was a stretch. Hey! <laughs> banging well done, Nick. for the bucks. Bang. That is the, <laughs> the next, that's the next tour. That's the tour title. <laughs> I'm going to come bang for the buckaroos. Hey, now I have a, like, you uh, you mentioned earlier, you were saying the phrase acknowledging the passage of time, and I would like to inquire, have you noticed any changes in your hands, in, like, in your physical physicality and uh, approach to guitar? Is it changing? Are you like, oh, wow, like, sometimes I'm getting sore hands or sore elbows or anything, or is everything still? No, uh, I think hands and elbows for me are pretty safe. I, d- I, d- I still warm up my wrists. But it's shoulders, mm. and I I think shoulders are the um, because really when you engage with the guitar, it's all shoulder work. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the reasons that I stay uh, unbroken <laughs> is that I I don't practice ten hours a day and never have. Um, and that's not I don't recommend that to people, but I also. I have a very I have a zero tolerance policy for twinges. So if I'm p- playing and anything hurts, that's we're done. We're not gonna you know we're done. Like yeah. we stop. And if I'm playing on stage and something feels off, I I just will figure out a, a way to adjust so that you know if the song needs to end early, if some <laughs> and I don't and that does not happen often, but that is a I think people get injured because they push hard. And that's across all levels of, of, you know, that's across all careers. I think that's the American way. (laughs) I want to change gears a little bit and get into gear. Talk about the actual physical instrument and the pieces that you use with it. Um, One thing I've seen you using a lot lately on your uh, socials and YouTube and stuff like that is this this passerelle bridge. Am I saying it right? Is it passerelle? Une passerelle. It's French. <laughs> I, I can't do it. Okay. No, it's it's it, it's passerelle. It's it just means a, a, a small bridge. So my collaborator is uh, Rachel Rosencrantz is a French luthier. She lives in um, America, but she came up with the name because it's just a bridge, just a bridge. Hmm. And so you, I've seen some videos where you're kind of explaining how to use it. Mm-hmm. Um, that can you do? like any kind of tunings in it because it's like a perfect fourth apart right fifth apart uh it's a well i mean it's funny because it's it's a tempered perfect fifth i should be very clear <laughs> yeah it's a, it's a almost perfect right the imperfectness is exactly what you were looking for and and the uh the the change each guitar is going to be different therefore um you know we we basically averaged it so I'll just give a little background. The passerelle idea I I have seen in practice in various ways over many years. Um, Baji Assad was the first person I saw. A couple of other, you know, Cuban players just sticking magic markers underneath their strings and going, you know, I mean, it's a it's a cool idea. I'd used um, one that David Torn had for... Uh, Everybody Loves You. No, sorry, that's my first record. Uh, likes, to, <laughs> likes to Make Us Longer, which he produced. And there's a song on there that um, that uses that. So I had just never... I, like, needed a producer. I, I, I was using... I mean, look, this is, an, 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 this is easy to do, right? You stick something underneath your strings and you make sounds. Like, this is not impos- an impossible con- concept. Um, what I wanted it to do is stay a little bit more in tune and stay put. So I had been like digging out the bottoms of, you know, spatula handles or anything that I could kind of was, you know, small. It was a little bit of like weird wood woodworking, um, like sculptor's tools I could kind of get. So I'm digging out the bottom to, to create a notch for the fret. So, it, you know, when the strings put the tension on, mm-hmm. it pushes it down onto the fret and it doesn't go anywhere. It sits on the, the 16th fret? It's if it, I mean, it could sit on any fret. The 16th. So what Rochelle did is that she 
you know, I showed her this. So it was like two years before. I mean, we were, we are, we are just frog and toad together. We like can barely get our butts out of bed. And we like have, we're so, and we're not ambitious. We're just, we want to be creative. We don't, we're like, I don't know. Should we sell this? I have no idea. We finally, after two years of talking about it, made some prototypes. And, you know, it was the, how high should it be? And also how spaced out should the strings, the notches on the passerelle be for the strings? Because that was what was the, if we could take all the guitars in the world and figure out the average of them, that's where we'd want that to be. So it'd be perfectly in tune with that one average guitar. And then every other guitar is going to have its own kind of, you know, interpretation of that. So that was a dis that was a decision that was done by Rochelle, which you know she's an engineer and a luthier and a very awesome and creative person. Um, so that is the origin of the uh, model itself being something that's a little more standardized um, than your average, I don't know, like hammer handle. But this hammer handle can work well, really well. Just so you know. Do you uh, use it as like an inspiration tool, a jumping off point? Because I know you've written a couple songs that I can definitely hear it on, uh, on the records. But do you use it often just as a, let's just get the creative juices flowing? Or is it more like dedicated? I'm going to write a song with this right now. It's a very specific sound. So it's, it's, um, um, what was the question? Uh, do you use... You know the answer, which is, I don't know what I do when I do it. I have no idea. I don't have any rhyme or reason. Stuff just happens. Yeah. I'm, I, you know, and I'm like, I've got an eight-year-old and a five-year-old. I barely get to, I, I barely get to eat a bagel, okay? So, like, I just, uh, asking me, like, how do you do what you're doing? It's just, it's, it's crazy. I, I, I don't know. But the passerelle itself is... It is a very nice place to go if you are out of ideas or if you're like, I just got to hear something different. This thing is just sounding the same no matter what I do. And I really need this to be, I need a new, I need a new instrument, but that's a lot of money and space. So I'm going to put this thing on, on my guitar and just say, okay, what does this, what does this say to me? Well, I'm really now intrigued and want to know, how do you find time to play guitar with an eight-year-old and a five-year-old? Hey. I, I, I don't. I don't. <laughs> if, if I put on the calendar at 2 p.m., we will be playing guitar from t 2 to 3.30, I'd rather die. I would just rather die than make that my life. And I know that's a very, very, very privileged thing to say, but like, ugh, make it work and I am uninterested, you know? <laughs> now, make it forbidden or make it something that is secretive and kind of you know, like just for me and I get to be like a little gargoyle with my little weird guitar and my weird songs and my weird shit that I do. That's, that's what I'm about. The Acoustic Guitar Podcast is brought to you by the team at Acoustic Guitar Magazine. I'm your host, Nick Grizzle, joined for this episode by Jamie Stillway. The Acoustic Guitar Podcast is directed and edited by Joey Lusterman. Tanya Gonzalez is our producer. Executive producers are Lizzie Lusterman and Stephanie Campos Delbroy. Our theme song was composed by Adam Perlmutter and performed for this episode by Jamie Stillway. If you enjoyed this podcast and want to support us, please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash acoustic guitar plus or find the link in the show notes for this episode. As a supporter, you'll have access to exclusive bonus episodes along with other special perks. And if you're already a patron, thank you so much for your support.